So we thank you for joining us. And Frank, you're a master. Right, I'm so you, impressed with everything you've done. Can you pop up done. my PowerPoint? Yep. Please. Oh, yeah. Good. Hi. Well, good morning. I'm Frank Townsend. And I'm a third generation Zonian, which means that both sets of my grandparents were involved in the canal construction. And I am delighted to be here with you this morning to share the legacy of my grandparents with you. But before I get started, I'm just curious, how many of you have been to the canal? Oh, that's good. So I hope that I can provoke a memory or some type of fond memory. And if not, I hope that I can entice you. What's Marguerite? And for those of you who haven't seen the canal, I hope maybe I can entice you to make a visit. Um, I'm a retired civil engineer. And so this will be one of those rare canal presentations that have to do with a lot of engineering involving the construction of the canal. And the canal was constructed at the turn of the century, and that was the old dig. And then after the Carter Torrijos Treaty in 2000, Panama took over the canal. And because of the larger ships that were taking place and coming to be done, an expansion was made, and that was done by the Panama, by the country of by the country of Panama. And I call that the new dig, which talks about the expansion. So that's the subject that I'm going to be in for. We're going to talk about the old dig. I'm going to talk about the new dig. There we go. All right. The original canal was 1904 to 1914, a 10-year period. The expansion, 2007, about 100 years later to 2016. Project as much as you can. All right. So here we are in the country of Panama, about 1,100 miles due south of Miami, latitude nine. And if you take a look at this, you see that the canal runs northwest to southeast. And one of the real cool things about the geography of Panama is that if you live here in the town of Balboa, where I grew up, you'll watch the sun rise out of the Pacific Ocean and watch it set in the Atlantic Ocean. My key part is in 1905, John F. Stevens arrived and became the second engineer. But until the time that John F. Stevens arrived, things were not going very well for the Panama Canal. And I am firmly convinced in my mind, if John F. Stevens had not come in 1905 and turned around the trends that were taking place, the canal would have never been completed at that particular point in time. But I digress. So let me go forward and tell you what happened before John F. Stevens showed up. In 1879, Ferdinand de Lesseps, at the grand old age of 74, forms the Interoceanic Canal Company. He had just completed the Suez Canal, and he was feeling very, very confident. He had the backing of the French engineers, the best engineers in the world at that time, and he was confident that he could tame Panama. There's the grand old man. And so he raised $60 million through bonds and stocks. And this would later turn out to be the Enron disaster of that particular point in time. Without ever, without ever coming to Panama, he proposes that he can, in seven years, build a sea level canal 72 feet wide and 30 feet deep. That was his proposal sitting in France, never having seen Panama. That did not work out very well because 10 years later, the company went completely bankrupt and 20,000 lives were lost, primarily due to disease. This is a picture of the French cemetery over at Mount Hope on the Atlantic side. So a series of events starts taking place. In 1903, the United States was very anxious to build a canal. And so they approached Colombia, which did own Panama. Panama was just a province of Colombia. And so the Colombians were approached by the United States 
And the same monetary deal that the French had was offered to the Colombians. That is, we'll pay you $10 million up front and we'll give you a quarter of a million dollars annually. Same identical monetary plan that was given by the French. But in this particular time, the Colombians said, nah, for whatever reason, they don't want it. They rejected it. I strongly suspect there may be greed involved, but nevertheless, they reject it. Well, Panama is not very happy about this. They have been this poor stepchild all this time to Colombia. They see a golden opportunity slipping through their fingers. They had tried several times before to succeed from Colombia and form an independent company country. So they declare independence once again. But this time, something happens. The USS Nashville conveniently shows up in Colon Harbor with a contingency of 500 US Marines. And the Colombian garrison in, in Colon at that time says, eh, I don't think so. And they got on their ships and they scurry back to Cartagena. Independence is declared and there's pretty much a bloodless coup that takes place. And so Panama is now an independent country. A series of treaties were arranged and signed somewhat a little bit favorable to the United States, but the treaty that the United States achieved was that they would get a strip of land 10 miles wide, five miles on each side of the center line of the canal in perpetuity, and that was good enough. And so they decided that they would not build a canal in Nicaragua, that was decided, and that Panama was the place for building the canal. And so in 1904, things start to happen. And John Wallace is the first chief engineer that's assigned. He doesn't set a very good precedence because when he comes down with his wife, he brings two coffins with him. <laughs> He's not very confident about what's gonna take place. And he lasts one year, but he did do one major thing in that time. He introduced the Bakira steam shovel and that was his legacy. There's John Wallace, chief engineer, the first one. So finally, we get to John F. Stevens. And John F. Stevens is a railroad man. He made his career out of building the Union Pacific Railroad. He's used to very, very large projects, railroad projects, for example, how to handle workforces, how to get things done. And so John F. Stevens shows up and it's my mind, this is finally the turning point because to continue down the path that had been done, I'm pretty sure John Wallace would have failed the same as the French did. The first thing he does, he says, oh, wait a minute, we're gonna resist the pressure to make the dirt fly. And instead he says, you know, I think we better put in some infrastructure. And so he starts putting in sanitation, fresh water, garbage collection, housing. The foodstuffs have to come for the United States. That supply line is very, very long. He's got to get coal to come into the, from the United States to power his equipment. That's a long supply chain. But so John F. Stevens builds infrastructure first. He's not digging any canal. He's building infrastructure. And most importantly, he gives a very young doctor named Gorgas a free hand against yellow fever. Gorgas had this idea that the mosquito was the vector for malaria and not the mall air, which is the swamp fevers that come out of the swamps adjacent to, but rather the mosquito is the vector. And he attacks very vigorously. He has screening, he does fumigation, he empties the cisterns that the breeding grounds for the mosquitoes, and he does a magnificent job in defeating the mosquito. It's a very large area now. He's moving all of Balboa, Panama City, the whole canal zone area. So he's got a major effort under place. But nevertheless, Gorgas is successful. We need recreation for the workforce. So we build clubhouses. We sponsor sports teams. We have bowling alleys. We have tech activities for the workforce. And yes, indeed, the wives are encouraged to come down. My grandmother went down in 1908 and Grandma Townsend went down in 1910. So 
we're starting to see the women show up and create an environment for the workforce, which is predominantly male. But most importantly, my good friend, John F. Stevens, gets on the ship and he's deathly seasick at the time, makes his way to Washington, and he convinces the Senate by a mere five votes that a sea level canal is totally impractical, will not work, no way, no how, and that we're gonna have to use a lock canal. And it kind of amazes me as an engineer that politicians are making technical decisions of this magnitude, but nevertheless, such it is. So we now have abandoned the sea level canal and we're gonna make a lock canal. Things are falling in place. And there is good old John F. Stevens at his work desk. And this is a picture of the mosquito brigades. And what they have in here is kerosene or fuel oil and they spray it on the water in the ditches. Now the mosquito to breathe, the larvae have to come to the surface and breathe. But if there's a film of oil, they suffocate because they can't penetrate the oil and the oil floats on the top. And this is where they did it. And so these guys wandered throughout all of the place, spraying kerosene on top of any puddle of water they could find. And that's the system that was used. The workforce primarily came from the island of the West Indies. Barbados, there's 65,000 was the biggest workforce at the time. <clears throat> and they primarily came from the islands of Barbados, Trinidad, Martinique. And these are the guys that did the backbreaking work that made the canal function. Bad news, 1907, Stephen says, I had it. He resigns, but all the key components are in place and he's ready to go. So at least that much is done. He's exhausted, he's on the verge of a breakdown. But yellow fever has been eradicated. The railroad system that he used from his early background is firmly in place for moving the large quantities of soil that need to be removed from the cut. Roosevelt is infuriated. He says, my chief engineers keep resigning on me. I'm gonna appoint somebody that can't resign. So he appoints Gothels, who is a Lieutenant Colonel in the US Army Corps of Engineers and he can't resign. And here he is. And he completes the canal and he oversees the damming of the Chagres River with Gatun Dam that created Gatun Lake and the digging of the cut and the building of the locks. And this is what under him. He is a wonderful organizer. Being a military man, he sets up the divisions and gets them work. And where he needs technical help, he hires good, sharp engineers to carry him through. But he's a wonderful military operator and he knows how to make things function. And all he's doing is following the blueprint that Stevens left for him. So let's take a little trip through the canal to show you where we are. I'm gonna start up here on a southbound transit and I'm gonna start up here at the Atlantic coast. And we're gonna go a distance of seven miles to Gatun Locks. At Gatun Locks, we'll go up three flights, three chambers, to an elevation of 85 feet above sea level, which is where Gatun Lake is. Gatun Dam is sitting here and it forms Gatun Lake. We're then gonna traverse Gatun Lake and notice that it's 24 miles. Gatun Lake is the major part of the canal, it's a lake. At this particular point, the lake is following the Chagres River channel and the Chagres River turns abruptly to the east. And so this is the north entrance of Gaylord Cut where most of the construction and the landslides and everything took place. So this is where the excavation is in this nine miles. So nine miles through Gaylord Cut. And we arrive at Peter McGill Locks. Peter McGill is one chamber. And so we step down about 30 feet. We then cross Miraflois Lake, a distance of a mile and a half. And this lake will become important when we talk about the expansion. So just put that in mind. We're now at Miraflois Locks 
and we'll step down two chambers and we're now at the Pacific Ocean and it's eight and a half miles out to the Pacific Ocean. Total distance of about 50 miles from deep water to deep water. Average time of transit is about eight hours. Well, the Gatun Dam, which formed the lake, is the key component. But let me share a little bit with you. In those days, hydraulic filled dams were very, very important. And this is the way Gatun Dam was built. Initially, a starter dike will be placed here at both toes. The material, the soil will be slurried up and pumped through pipes. And then as it is pumped out of the pipes, the gravel and the sands being the coarser material will settle out first and the clay being the finer material will settle out into a pool and it's impervious. The clay will be impervious and form the barrier to the water. And so the gravels and the sands support the clay core. The disadvantage with this type of thing is there's no compaction and the only compaction that takes place is due to the self weight of the components that are in here. And so without that compaction taking place, it's not a very good system. Hydraulic fill dams are not built anymore, except some of the tailings dams in the mining areas that still use this technique. So here's a starter dike. The material is being transported from the cut and you can see the spoil trains dumping to form the starter dikes. It's a hydraulic fill dam, as I mentioned, because bedrock is extremely deep. It's 200 feet down to bedrock. And so you couldn't build a masonry dam because there's no rock to tie in to the abutments like you would in most dams. You'd used to have a rock part to tie it into. It's not there. It's 200 feet, 180 plus 100 plus another 20. It's 200 feet down to bedrock. So a hydraulic fill dam is logical. This shows you the pumping taking place, the gravels and sands settle out and the clay forms out here in the pond and becomes the impervious core for the dam. Oh my gosh, here we are. Eight years into the project and all of a sudden a massive settlement takes place, 20 feet, 20 feet, 800 feet long. And if I was Gothels as the chief engineer at this time, I would have gone <gasps> and reached for my second cup of coffee because this is not good. This is not good. And so now in jeopardy is the dam, which is going to form the lake. And so the key component of the, of the whole canal is in jeopardy. And this is what it looks like. And this is not good. Well, there's nothing like bad news to sell newspapers. And so the headlines, and of course the French related, a little bit of sour grapes, I think, but nevertheless. The New York Times reports, will the Gatun Dam stand? And a board of engineers has to come down and do an analysis. And they say, yes, they think it'll work. So how do we solve the problem? It's very, 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 very simple. You just flatten the side slopes. So instead of being five to one and downstream 10 to one, the slides reduce it to 16 to one, which is about four degrees for the first 30 to 60 feet. And then eight to one, which is about seven degrees for the remaining from 60 feet to 90 feet of the top. To put things in perspective, those of you that climb the stairs like Rod does, those are at about 37 degrees when you go up and down the stairs here at Oak Hammock. If you want to take a look at a handicap ramp, that's only about five degrees. And so we're now looking at a very, 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 very flat slope. And that solved your problem. That solved your problem. Final cross section. The hydraulic fill, Gatun Lakes at 85, top elevation. You can see the way the dam looks like is something like this. This is the spillway that controls the water levels. And these gates here will be part of the expansion consideration. So we'll have to talk about those later 
This is what Gatun Dam looks like, a large, massive slope, a hydroelectric power plant down here to provide electrical power to the locks. This is, this is Gatun Locks and the town of Gatun where my, grand, where my grandfather lived and my father grew up sits right here. There's the spillway. It's not very high, it's only 105 feet high, about a mile and a quarter long, very, very thick at the base because the slopes are so flat, 23 million cubic yards, and it forms Gatun Lake, 164 square miles. This is the largest hydraulic fill dam until Fort Peck was built in the late 40s, and it's the largest man-made lake until Lake Mead formed behind Hoover Dam, and it's equal in area to about the size of Barbados. So now that we have the dam built and the lake coming, let's turn our, our attention to the construction of the cut. As I mentioned before, Stevens has set up a railroad system. So the trains come in empty, they're loaded up and they go back out. And so it's just a continuous cycle. These you can see the trestles or the trains running back and forth along the terraces. The Byrokyrus steam shovel is the workhorse. And up here in the corner, you can see the star drills at work drilling dynamite holes. The spoil train being loaded by the steam shovel. And in 1906, Teddy Roosevelt decides he wants to visit the canal. And he says, I wanna see it under the worst conditions. So he comes down in November at the height of the rainy season. <clears throat> Worst time to visit Panama, so don't ever plan a cruise to go to Panama in, in November. Not good. Anyway, being a good politician that he is, he immediately jumps up in the cab of one of these things, has this iconic photo taken, and he's immortalized forever. This is what Culebra Cut looked like before. And if you notice, the slopes are extremely steep. You can already see one landslide taking place here, and you can see the spoil train systems. The town site of Culebra, where my grandmother came after she got married and my mother was raised and in her childhood, sits up here on the banks. This town site eventually was lost. As the canal opened up, it slid in and so it disappeared. Force, new dangers surfaced. The hardest work was in the Culebra Cut, where whole mountains were removed to carve a path eight miles long, 300 feet wide, 50 feet deep. This man-made gorge would later be filled with the cool waters dammed from the Chagres River. Until then, the men worked in 120 degree temperatures to blast away sliding hillsides and dig 200 trainloads of... Special dumping devices allowed the trains to be unloaded with one giant sweep, depositing millions of tons of soil to create a huge earthen dam one and a half miles long, a half mile thick at the base. It would take that much volume to hold back the water of the huge man-made lake. Meanwhile, in the cut, 61 million pounds of dynamite was the primary tool for moving earth. The explosive force was equal to all the firepower used in all the wars the United States had fought up until that time. Not only do we have to contend with landslides, but it rains in Panama and flooding was a problem as well. This is not good. In 1913, Woodrow Wilson as president sends a telegraph signal and there was a dike that was constructed here to keep the waters of Gatun, Gatun Lake from flowing into the cup during construction. So in 1913, we're gonna explode and destroy the dike. The water's gonna go rushing in to Calabra Cut and the rest of the excavation that takes place in the cut will be done by dredging. So hydraulic dredges will be removing it and they merely excavate and load it up on spoil barges and take it out. Town site of Calabra is still existing. Landslides are still there. So this is what it looked like before. And due to the landslides, an additional 20 million cubic yards were added to the initial excavation, 
And that represents about 25% of the total spoil that had to be removed. Originally, the slopes for the canal were one to one, 45 degrees, extremely steep. They didn't stand at all. And gradually the soil and the landslides moved back and the prism worked its way back to a more stable, almost about 11 degrees. Large quantity of earth had to be moved in here. The canal has been widened from the original 300 in 1914 to 600 during the expansion, just before the expansion in 2002. But that's the prism of the canal. So let's talk a little bit about some quantities. I'll go quickly. The US takes out about 323 million cubic yards. The French gave contributed about another 30 that was useful. So the total excavation is somewhere in the neighborhood of 600, 262 million cubic yards. Well, just to put that in perspective, that would cover oak hammocks, 136 acres with about 1,200 feet of soil. That's about 17 times the height of building one or building two. After the canal was open, landslides continued and they added an additional 91.5 million cubic yards. And then the canal expansion takes place and it's 190 million cubic yards or it's about 72% of the original canal excavation and expansion. And it's being done by more modern equipment, of course, using excavators and very, very large dump trucks. This is a very simplistic view of how the locks work. And what's gonna happen is the ship goes in, the locks are nothing more than a series of water stairs. And what happens, gates will open and the water will flow from the upper one and equalize here. A series of valves will open here and all this is gravity flow. Now, when this lowers here, this water is completely lost because it flushes out to the ocean. And so it takes 52 million gallons to put a single transit through. I'll talk about that later because the expansion picked up on this and said, we're wasting too much water when we do this. Let's take our turn our attention to the locks. These are the lock gates. They're seven feet thick, 65 feet wide because the width of the chamber is 110 feet. And the largest weighs about 740 tons. There's a grid work of steel and steel plates are riveted over it. These are miter gates, that is they meet in a V shape with a V pointing to the higher water elevation and the water pressure then keeps the gates sealed. This is the locks under construction. The lock walls are extremely thick, about 24. These are the large culverts. You could drive a, locom a locomotive could be driven through the culverts to that large because they need to move large quantities of water when it opens. This is a picture of Gatun locks underneath its first filling, filling. And the water flows through the main culverts here in the center wall and on the side walls. And then there's laterals that come across and there's five culverts here that open and the water comes up here. It takes about 15 minutes to fill a chamber. So, the locks are 110 feet wide and 1,000 feet long. It took four years and it took 4.5 million cubic yards of concrete to build them. That's 40% larger than Hoover Dam and Hoover Dam was built in 35. So it's a true testament to those engineers that figured out the right proportions of water, cement and gravel and sand to come up with the mixers that could be poured into these massive locks and come up with one that would survive. The locks are still working very well today, well over a hundred years, and the concrete is not deteriorated at all. So it's a real testament to those guys, those engineers that came up with that. Eh, how much does this cost? Well, the US gave the French $40 million to buy their equipment and rights. 
And then it cost the U.S. $312 million. And so the total contribution then for the canal is $352 million, or in today's money, about $9.6 billion. And if you add in the French contribution, the total cost is in here. Please note that the United States came in $23 million under budget. Woohoo! Considering that's a Corps of Engineer government job. What do you think, Jeff? Woohoo! That's a real feat. I'm gonna take you through a southbound transit. And so we're gonna go through the canal and you'll see some of the key components. We're now approaching gap tune locks. There are three chambers and we will step up 85 feet. Yes, when it rains, it will definitely clear like that. This is the town of the North Entry to the Cut. We're now going down to the five miles of the Cut. We now are arriving at Peter McGill Lock with the single chamber step down. This is Mirafoy's Lake, a mile and a half. Two chambers at Mirafoy's. And we're now in the Pacific Ocean. We will pass underneath the Bridge of the Americas at the south entrance of the canal. Okay. Whew. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn my attention now to the expansion that took place. Panama through the Carter and Torrijos treaties in the year 2000 took over control of the canal. And because container ships are becoming larger and larger and larger, the canal needs a refreshing and an upgrade. And so the Panamanians will build the expansion. 5.7 billion, 2016. The key part of it is, is that the old locks were a thousand feet by 110 and only 40 feet deep. The new locks are gonna be 1400 by 180 and they're gonna be 60 feet deep. Now, if you do your math and you pay attention real, real closely, you notice that the ship in this particular part is 965 from 1,000 feet. So that leaves about 35 feet at the front to be divided. That's 17 and a half feet in front of the ship and behind the ship. But if you take a look at the new locks and you do the math, the maximum ship is 1,200 and this is 1,400. That's 200 feet, which means there's a hundred feet in front and in back of the lock. What's going on? I'll answer your question in a few minutes. That's a lot of free space given up in my opinion. However, I didn't design it, I'm not in charge. Now, the key thing to point out is that the draft is gonna be increased to 50 feet instead of the 40 feet that we had with the original canal. So these are the new locks. There are seven key components, starting over on the Atlantic side. Deepening and widening. The new set of locks will be built here. We will also have to raise the height of Gatun Lake by about 0.4 meters. That's about 
15, 16 inches. And to do that, we must increase the height of the spillway gates on Gatun Dam. We'll do that. We will dredge the channel out so it's now deeper to handle the 50 foot draft. Because of Miraflores Lake, we will have to build an access channel to bypass Miraflores Lake says we're only gonna put in one series of locks instead of having two. And so this is the new lock system we hear. Here's the old Miraflores Lake and here's the new access channel. And I'm gonna talk about the dam that's being built here. This is the old Miraflores locks and this is the new expansion locks. And then lastly, we'll have to deepen and widen the Pacific exit. Well, a very smart thing was done in this particular case because we lose so much water, the water saving basins were thought of. And what will happen is, is we will reclaim the water by storing it in water saving basins as we empty the locks, as the water levels drop from lock to lock rather than losing the 52 million gallons as we did before. Please note there's something that's going on here. And at the end and the front of both ships is a tugboat. And so we will rely on tugboats to guide the ships through the locks. And I'll talk about that in a few minutes. This is the way the water chambers work. The water goes into the water saving basins. The ship exits the chamber and then it's refilled from the water saving basins. And so it saves about 7% less water than the old locks did. This is a schematic of what's taking place. The access chamber we can be built, the access channel will be built. The new locks will be placed in here, the water saving basins. This is the old Miraflores locks, the old Peter McGill locks, and this is Miraflores Lake. And so the access channel has to pass that. As part of the access channel, one of the key things is Barinkin Dam, and that particular dam is a more modern built dam. It's compacted clay with very large filters and very, very thick shells on the outside to hold it up. And it's a distance of 30 feet, 10 meters is the elevation. As I mentioned before, got Peter McGill Lock drops down about 30 feet. <laughs> Nothing like a little bit of bad news to sell a newspaper. And so, Controversy arises, it's a major earthquake looming. And what's got everybody excited is that right smack dab through the middle of all this runs the Pedro McGill Fault. And so if that fault is active, they got a problem. The good news is when you have a building, a dam in an earthquake zone area, who do you turn to? And so they turn to a group of engineers called Dames and Moore out of Los Angeles. And I suspect that California has a lot of experience building dams and earthquake zones. <laughs> and I'm very comfortable with the dam that's been designed that it will work very, very well. This is what the new locks work, look like. And I'm just pointing out that we lose 200 feet and that's due to the tugboats in the front and the back. This is what it looks like in the new lock system, the tugboats guiding the ship and notice that there's not a lot of clearance. And so in my mind, I'm a little bit nervous, but I'm not in charge, a little bit nervous about how well one of these tugboats can maintain the alignment of the ship inside the chamber. I'm gonna contrast that with the old system where we used electric towing motors on the side and the cables, and it would be a simple matter for the pilot to say, you know, locomotive number one, tighten up, locomotive number two, loosen up, and I can move the ship and I have very, very tight control inside of it. The thing that makes the control so fun is you've got to remember is these very large ships move in 
to the lock, they push in a wave of water. The wave of water hits the lock gate in front and it bounces back. And so there's a sloshing effect that's taking place before they get the final gate closed. And so this requires some rather precision alignments inside the lock chambers. This is a schematic of how the new lock, the expansion lock will work. The water basins. I'm not gonna sit down. The rolling gates instead of the miter gates. And this is a video showing it taking place. The roller gates coming through, you can see the back of the tugboat. This is Gatun Lake sitting out here. Yeah, that's, I'm a little bit concerned, but I'm not in charge. They're using tugboats, no mules. The roller gates pinch in here. That's a good design. I like the roller gates. Now, why is all this important to us? Well, if you deepen and you're taking 50 foot draft channels, guess what? Only Norfolk on the East Coast ports has a 50 foot depth. And so folks are scrambling along the East Coast to do some dredging, particularly this city of Savannah to accommodate the deeper draft. And so this has created a great boom for dredging divisions in the Corps of Engineers throughout the Eastern Seaboard. And with that note, I'll leave you at a sunset looking at Mirafloy's Lakes. And I will conclude my presentation for you all. And I'll try to answer any questions that you may have. So the question is, how much does it cost for a ship to go through the canal? And then maybe just repeat what okay, you said. Okay, there's, there's for the people out there in Zoom land. And there's a, a question that Marty had about the, um, the tolls. Yes, it's a, it's a very, 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 it's a very, very, is it based upon the size of the ship? Yes, when the United States ran the canal up in the year 2000, they did not do it on a for-profit basis. When Panama took it over, they turned it into a moneymaker to support their economy. And so there was a major division on how it is. The old way, it was based upon the weight what they call the tonnage of the ship or the size of the ship is the way that the money came up with. And I presume somehow we came out with the equation that Robert Halliburton had to pay 36 cents based upon his size. I don't know, <laughs> they figured it out. The Panamanian model is extremely complicated because if you want priority, suppose you've got some Christmas toys that you want in New York for the Harbor, you can pay extra and move to the head of the line. And so there is strictly a business model in what they do now. And so I've tried to understand their equation and I cannot figure out how they charge you. I can't figure it out. Okay. Okay, back to me. We have a couple comments here. What are the key technological innovations that would simplify the construction of such a canal? Well, the main innovation that I see was the development of the Portland cement that formed the massive locks was really, really a tribute. It's withstood well over a hundred years and the mixed design that they came up was enormous. The technologically, the lessons learned were the rest of it. Landslide technology did not exist until the 1930s and it really wasn't developed until we got computers in the 1960s. And so we did not contribute much except that landslides were not very good to have as far as the canal was concerned, but the innovation of moving large quantities of earth by railroad system was innovative, but it had to be used at that particular time. Nowadays, that was, it's obsolete. So that would be the biggest technological. And of course, Gorgas's magnificent work in defeating the mosquito is probably, you know, ranks with nothing. He should have been given a Nobel prize all right, Rick Gold, if you'd like to unmute. Yeah, 
You, you talked about this being a, a project of the Army Corps of Engineers, if I'm correct. And um, I'm wondering to what extent, how did the Army Corps of Engineers organize themselves uh, for this project? And what was the impact on the history of uh, the Army Corps of Engineers? Oh, it was, it was great. It, was, it took place when Stevens resigned in 1907. And Teddy Roosevelt said, hey, I'm tired of my chief engineers resigning. I'm going to appoint someone that can't resign. And so he appointed a commissioned officer in the Corps of Engineers. And Gothals went down and completed the canal. And that's when the Corps of Engineers was pretty much in charge of the waterways. And so it was Gothals as the third chief engineer. Uh, he was a lieutenant colonel at the time. He later retired, and I think as a major general, but I'm not sure. But that, that was where the Corps got involved. And he was a magnificent organizer. I mean, he just took over the blueprint that Stevens left him technologically, but as far as managing people and equipment and getting things done, that's, his, that's what he did. Any other questions or comments? Okay, I'm coming over, hold on. Oh, uh, Frank, what? Was the increase in the footprint? Uh, we have a lake now. When it started, what were there? Was there one lake, a number of lakes, a number of creeks, rivers? Were there villages and towns that were eliminated by eminent domain? Yeah, Gat Gatun Lake pretty much eliminated several town sites. Those towns were again. Um, eminent domain, and they were bought out and relocated. But Gatun Lake just merely took over the Chagres River. The Chagres River is the key component. And when it rains in the Chagres River, a flood of 17 feet is not unusual. And so it was very fortunate that the Gatun Lake just merely followed the main channel of um, the Chagres River. There are a few other small rivers that flow in, the Mandinga, but they're trivial. They don't amount to much of a contribution to the main lake. Uh, Frank, uh, I wanted to ask you about the uh, new canal and the old canal. Uh, do ships uh, transit uh, both uh, canals today or are they all using only the new one? No, they use both, both, both chambers are used, I mean, depending upon the size of the ship. The okay. bottleneck, of course, is if I have a Panamax ship, which is a super, super tanker, I got to get through the cut, and that's only one-way traffic. So if even though I have a huge ship that can use the new locks, I've got nine miles of Calabra cut that can only handle one-way traffic. And so that shuts down the system when you have one of these big, 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 ships coming through. And so that's the bottleneck. That's the bottleneck is the cut. Um, another question, uh, did, did your entry into uh, civil engineering uh, start as a result of watching the canal uh, operate and inspire you? I probably think so. I didn't realize it at the time in my childhood, <laughs> but I probably picked it up and then later I worked my summer jobs while I was a sophomore and junior in college. I come home for the summers and I worked the canal and I worked out of the dredging division and that probably increased my interest in it. I was wondering if Gatchun Lake, you assume that a lake is fresh, fresh water. Is it now mixed with salt water? No, no, no. And that is one of the environmental concerns in the dry season the lake goes down and what's happened is it goes down so much because of global warming, they're not getting the rains that they used to get. And so as the elevation of the lake goes down, they can no longer take the 50 foot drafts. And there's been talk about saying, well, why don't we just pump seawater back up in and refill up the lake. And fortunately, fortunately, that has just been a discussion item over cup of coffee, I guess, and they have not done it, but it's fresh water, it's fresh water. Why can't salt water be used in Gatton Lake? No reason why it can't be, it'd just be an environmental disaster. It'd just be an environmental disaster. Well, first of all, all the fishery that's taking place in the lake 
would go most of the rainforest that drives along the edge of the canal would probably be in jeopardy and it would just change the whole ecology. I give the Panamanian government real, real good credit. They are trying very, very hard to maintain the rainforest because they realize that if it gets deforested, then the rains are gonna wash in and this, it's gonna re-silt in the lake and that's not what they're trying to do. So they're trying desperately to maintain the rainforest along the sides of the canal so it doesn't get deforested. Any other questions on Zoom? Well, Frank was his own facilitator today and the presenter. I know Margaret had the brainchild of this course that, was, that got put together, but I'm sure you all joined me in thanking Frank for all of his work. And of course, there's a comment that says, you must publish your store of facts and details. So we thank Frank and he has uh, created or, or found two new present, two presenters for the next two weeks. So we appreciate everything today. It's amazing. And he's always so humble. And every time I spend time with Frank, I realize uh, next, what a Superman he is. To give you a preview, next week will be a Zoom presentation from some folks over at the library, a fellow by the name of John Nemers. And he's gonna talk about the role of the canal during World War II and primarily through the use of media, comic books, movies, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that is what the presentation will be that week. The following week on November the 3rd, which is Panama's Independence Day, we have a real treat. Joe Wood is coming down from Tallahassee and he's gonna talk about his personal experiences he was there during the treaty transition, the Carter Torrijos transition. He was there during Just Cause, and he, Joe will be very humble, but he was very, very well placed in the hierarchy. He's, he's what I call one of the upper, upper echelons, and so he knew what was taking place behind the scenes, and he'll just share his personal observation with it. So it'll be a very, very good, primarily political discussion what was taking place. I'm looking forward to hearing Joe's remarks. Um, I might say I, I would hope that uh, we'd have a large group in the Oak Room that day because he is coming all the way from Tallahassee and we'd like to give him a nice welcome. Thank you for joining us, everyone. Have a good day. <laughs>